So when I was in my old day job, I thought, great, if when I get to full time, it'll be so fantastic because I'll just, you know, sink right into it and write, I'll get loads done. But the shift from working for other people to completely working for yourself, I think a lot of un people underestimate the mindset shift there. And also obviously the pressure that all of your income is coming from your creativity. And that is a scary thing. Do you love science fiction and fantasy books? You found yourself in the right dimension. Welcome to the greatest podcast in the multiverse, where each week I talk to science fiction and fantasy authors about myth, magic, and the infinite possibilities of storytelling. I'm your host, Herman Stuernagel, and I will be taking you on a journey with some of your favorite authors, helping you to get to know them and possibly uncover some new literary gems along the way. Ready to explore? Because on this show, Every conversation is a doorway into a different world. Welcome once again to the greatest podcast in the multiverse. I am really excited to have my very first repeat guest. Uh, welcome here, S.W. Miller. Shane, you were my first guest. You're the first repeat guest. I'm glad to have you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back on the show. You're so welcome. Um, so Shane, for those of us that um, are for our listeners who might not have heard the very first episode, can you just give us a little bit of a recap of who you are and a little bit about your writing journey? Yeah, sure. So I am, well, I was an urban fantasy author last time I came on the show, but we'll talk about that, I'm sure, as we get into it. I'm a dark fantasy author who writes uh, retellings inspired by fairy tales, by folklore and by mythology. I'm also a non-fiction author. I write the Write Better Fiction craft guides under Shane Miller, uh, a writing coach and a book editor. So that is pretty much me. Now, Shane, um, as you mentioned, um, some things have changed for you since July. Can you give us a little bit of a recap of what's happened over the last year that uh, where the things are at for you now? Yeah, for sure. So a couple of things, uh, big things have changed. So last time I spoke to you, I was working uh, freelance alongside writing, So, um, which was fantastic. Don't get me wrong. I loved all the freelance work I was doing. At the end of last year, I was lucky enough to be able to stop all my freelance and I write full time now. So uh, I think that's the dream. Congratulations. For a lot of Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been a crazy whirlwind. Uh, I think that's the dream for a lot of us. And there are hard days, but it is a dream. Like I can't complain. So that's one big change that has happened since July. Uh, and the other big change, like I said, is is the genre shift. So um, I was noticing that urban fantasy has changed slightly, or at least the way I was looking at it has changed in that a lot of the urban fantasy charts on Amazon now include a lot of paranormal romance. So it was becoming difficult mm -hmm. to market myself as an urban fantasy author when the readers that I was targeting are now expecting uh, more romance in their stories. And that's, I have romance subplots, okay. but I don't want to write a romance, basically. Uh, which marked the shift into dark fantasy and so that I could focus on the darker themes, have a tiny bit of a romance subplot in there or not, but not necessarily make it a huge part of the story. Yeah, so it was uh, basically you were taking a look at where the genre kind of has, has mm. gone and you were you were not willing to, to go along with it. The main decision for me came down to how I was running my business. So before I was very KU heavy, my books were in KU. Um, I was targeting Amazon readers, of course, because the books were in KU. But I've kind of, uh, I made the decision to stop using KU, go wide and sell direct. So because I'm not so reliant on the Amazon ecosystem anymore, um, I don't really have to, to bend what I write to fit a certain genre that an Amazon reader expects. Don't get me wrong, still love Amazon readers and Amazon's fantastic for most of us, but it just gives me that little bit more flexibility on what I write, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of authors that seem to be shifting away from the KU model and from um, rapid release and that sort of thing. Is that, you know, some of those reasons, um, I think being, you know, their royalty rates and that sort of thing, is that part of the motivation that's driving you as well? Yeah, definitely. And you said about rapid release there. So when I first started writing, I did use a rapid release model for my first series. 
Um, and it's grueling. You know, it's really tough to release <laughs> a book a month. Yeah. Or in some cases, like some people are putting out a book every two weeks and, you know, all the power to them if you can do that. But for me, it's not sustainable. So by going direct, and I, I'd say probably adopting more of a traditional publishing release schedule in a, in that it's going to be, it'll be faster than trad pub, but not as fast as rapid release. So it just allows me to slow down, um, focus on quality a bit more, I'd probably say rather than quantity of books. And also, um, yeah, that when you're direct selling, I think there's, there's not that same pressure to keep pumping the algorithm with new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon really, um, when you're the rapid release model, part of that, the reasoning behind it was to keep the algorithm churning in your favor. And I think that uh, a lot of authors are realizing that that is a never ending losing battle, <laughs> trying yeah. to, to fight the algorithm and uh, getting out, you know, Amazon to work with you instead of against you. Cause I think in a lot of ways it works against us as authors. Um, yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm glad that you're moving in that direction. Um, I feel like it's going to take a lot of the pressure off of you. Um, mm. Now, moving into a, becoming full time, how how has that changed the way you write and how you're approaching your writing as, in general? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's freed up a lot more time for me to write because I'm treating it like a full time job now because that's what it is. Not a job in the sense that like when I worked in corporate before I became a writer at all, I hated my job. So I'm not treating it as a job that I'm going to hate. Uh, it's fun, mm -hmm. but I am kind of sticking to regular working hours and trying to make writing a routine habit. And that's something that I've never really been able to do before because I've always had other commitments. So for me, the main benefit of being a full-time author is that it takes the pressure off in terms of having to squeeze all my writing time into two or three hours a day, uh, having to work weekends constantly. So this way I get to, I get time to think about the books during my day and actually focus on some of the aspects that I didn't necessarily focus on too much before. So uh, setting is always really tricky for me. And I know that's a weird thing for a fantasy author to say, but the setting for me always comes in the edit. And where I had so little time before, I probably didn't put as much into setting as I could have done. So having that full time and that flexibility to work more hours is giving me the time I need to focus on the areas of craft where I know that I'm weaker in my own writing. Because it's really easy as an editor to, well, really easy, I say that. It's easier for me as an editor to tell other people where they need to improve their writing or where they could improve their writing than it is for me to do that myself when I didn't have a lot of time. Because obviously I was squeezing in uh, editing clients. I still have some editing clients that I work with uh, if, if I've worked with them for a long time. But yeah, having the time has definitely helped hugely because, I mean, you know what it's like. You're working, you're writing. It's hard to fit it all in. And the one thing I would say as well, for people that are thinking of going full-time and thinking that it's a magic bullet and you're going to have these endless expanses of time, that probably <laughs> hasn't worked out quite the way I thought because life still gets in the way. Um, it's definitely easier, but it's it's not like a, a catch-all solution to having loads of time. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and how, so shift, uh, I guess to expand on that a little bit, I know that Sasha mentioned the same thing when she shifted to full-time and how your writing um, window doesn't, it, you kind of almost lose direction. How, how, how did you find that transition and what did you do to kind of make sure you kept on track? Yeah, so it's really difficult, um, more difficult than I was expecting. So when I was in my old day job, I thought, great, if when I get to full time, it'll be so fantastic because I'll just, you know, sink right into it and write, I'll get loads done. And don't get me wrong, my productivity has definitely increased. But the shift from working for other people to completely working for yourself and working full time, I think a lot of un people underestimate 
the mindset shift there. And also, obviously, the pressure that all of your income is coming from your creativity. So unless I take more editing jobs or do more freelance work again, the bulk of my income is coming from my writing. And <clears throat> that that is a scary thing. So the, the thing that was behind my decision to go full time effectively is that I had uh, a lot of things that happened at the end of last year and I had a bereavement in the family and it forced me to look at my life and think about what I wanted my life to look like and the things that I really wanted to do. And part of that was going full time. And I had been stalling on going full time for a long time because I knew the adjustment would be hard, but obviously circumstance pushed me to do it. Um, but yeah, the mindset shift is difficult and the things that I have done to kind of cope with that and ensure that I get into a routine. This sounds ridiculous, but I have high uh, consistency in my Clifton strengths. So I need the consistency of believing I have a job, whether it's actually a job or not. So in my book, How to Write Novels Fast, I talk a lot about the little mindset hacks you can use to boost your productivity. Well, I needed some mindset hacks to be able to shift my mindset so that I could actually do this full time. One of those things was that because I have that high consistency and high belief, I wrote a contract for myself as if I was an employee that I was hiring into my company. So this sounds so boring and nerdy, but I tell like the hours that I wanted to work, what my responsibilities were. Um, again, I have high belief in my Clifton strength, so I need a sense of responsibility when I do something. And I signed it like I would a contract as if I was an employee. And for me, that's enough to trick my brain into being like, right, I'm committed to this. Because it is so easy when you don't have anyone being oversight and telling you what to do, like a manager, to drift. You spend longer thinking about things than you should. Or like for me, I have high deliberative. I know you do as well. And that can stall my decision making if I'm weighing up pros and cons of what project to pursue next or whatever else. So I did things like a business plan that tells me what projects I'm working on next so that I don't have to think about it. I did the contract so that I feel a sense of responsibility when I sit down to write. Um, and all that makes it sound terribly boring and confining, but if you have strength similar to me, that will help you. And it actually allows me to have more fun when I'm writing because I feel responsible for myself. I don't know if that made any sense because most strength stuff doesn't it didn't have the strengths, but yeah, it worked for me. Yeah, no, I know that makes a lot of sense to, I mean, to me, I think it takes a lot of the overwhelm out of the equation where you're wondering what to do next. I, I know even um, writing as not my full-time job, there are so many decisions you've got to make on a weekly basis of what, where to set your priorities. Cause it's not just sitting down and writing the book as much as, you know, that's the dream. Um, as much as you want that to be a hundred percent of what you're doing is writing and editing. I mean, there's marketing, there's business planning, there's all sorts of things that you've got to line up. And if, and if you go into it as full time, especially, I think, because when, because now you have a, you have your full day open and you can, I could easily see sitting around, wondering what to do all day and just kind of being um, frozen in an action because of, you know, um, paralysis by analysis type of thing where you're, you know, there's so much you could be doing that you don't know where to start. So if you're laying that out, that framework out initially, and that's step one, I could definitely see how that would be beneficial. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned like marketing and other activities that you have to do there. So writing full time does not mean writing full time. Um, and an author friend of mine, when I told them that I was going full time, the thing that they said to me that really stuck was you need to have, like, you need to plan your time effectively so that you can work in your business, as in creating the products and writing and doing all the things. But you also need to carve out the time to work on your business, as in growing the business, doing the marketing, forming, uh, networking, forming connections, all of those things that are going to help. And that works differently for different people. I've heard a lot of authors say that they'll do half days. So they'll like spend the morning writing and then the afternoon marketing or however their, their brain works. 
that doesn't work for me because I have that annoying consistency thing. Um, and task switching for me is really difficult during a day. So I have mapped out my week so that I effectively write for four days and <laughs> four days and one day. It rarely works out like that. But right in theory, I would write for four days and then do admin and marketing on the fifth day so that there's a clear um, delineation in my mind of what I'm actually working on. Otherwise, I can't work because my deliberative will start uh, thinking that I've made the wrong decision about what I'm working on. So you have to, it takes time, but I think just like with writing, you have to find your own process for managing the um, admin and operation side of a business as well. Yeah, um, I love that you found a system that has worked for you. Um, I, I know it took you a little while to, to kind of get to that point, but um, I think that is is really key for anyone, whether, I mean, full-time or not, um, putting a system in place where you're able to work in a way that is most efficient for you is, is really what's going to um, help out in the long run, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I want to pivot a little bit back into your your um, fiction and into your storytelling a little bit. Um, you talked a little bit about why you moved away from urban fantasy, it, you know, realizing that the genre um, didn't quite fit the stories you were writing anymore. Um, what made you pivot into um, dark fantasy and, and specifically dark fantasy retellings? Because I know that's kind of the direction that your new series is going into. Yeah, so two things happened there. Um, in terms of the retellings, that was never on my radar. So, uh, well, I say that. My first series is kind of a retelling because it's based on the King Arthur myth, but it's not a retelling in the sense that I'm actually taking the original thing and bending it to the genre or whatever. So that was never really part of my plan. But last year I was working on an urban fantasy project called the Demon Academy, and it completely stalled because of events that were happening at the time, and I couldn't get back into that project. So I needed something to reignite a passion for writing, and I went to a writing retreat last year, a short one, and the whole uh, premise was to write a short story that would be included in an anthology. And when I spoke to the organizer, I said, I really, I don't actually have an idea for this short story. I have no idea what I'm going to do. And they said to me, what they were going to do, because they're doing it with us, is use a random number generator and pick one of the Grimm's fairy tales to retell. And I was like, oh, cool. Well, I'll do that because it will give me something to do. I ended up getting Rapunzel and right. I wrote uh, the first, the short story that is belongs to this series now. It's supposed to be a palate cleanser and it turned into an entire series, which often happens. And uh, yeah, I wrote Locke, which is a Rapunzel meets Medusa retelling. And originally it was urban fantasy still. So I said it in a, a contemporary uh, world with magic and all that, the good stuff that I was writing before. And then a lot of things a lot of events played out in that short story that are probably a little bit too dark for the urban fantasy market. So when I think of urban fantasy that I've read in the past, things like Dresden Files and, and things that we're used to, yes, there are dark themes, but I felt like this series was going to be a lot, lot darker because I'd read some of the original fairy tales and how dark they are uh, before they were disney -fied. Yeah. I um I kind of thought I really love that and I wanted to to lean into it and not shy away from some of the the darker themes this time. And again, I think that's what's made writing fun for me again. I'm really leaning into the aspects of that type of fantasy that I love. So, yeah, partly it's because I had absolutely no ideas and it was a random number generator that picked that story for me and partly it's because I've spent a long time writing, and I think uh, you mentioned Sasha earlier. She's talked about this before as well. That I've finally let go of self censorship and worrying about what other people think of the content that I'm writing. Okay. So I'm just completely leaning into all those things that I love when I read books or watch, like Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I started reading that recently. Right. I love it, but it's so dark. 
Um, before I would have shied away from reading something like that. But now, if I love reading it, I should probably be writing it, right? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And obviously you're enjoying what you're writing more because of it. Um, I can even tell by the way you're, you're talking about what you're writing yeah. that yeah. Um, you're enjoying the process more. So um, I love it. And yeah, um, Empire by the Vampire. That's one of my, or Empire of the Vampire. That was one of my favorite reads last year, um, 2020. Yeah two at least uh, so good so and and very very dark but man what a storyteller that guy is yeah um, so you told us a little bit about the prequel short story lock um now but you have an upcoming novel in the same series titled glass can you tell us what that is and what it is all about yeah definitely so after writing lock the uh, a character who is effectively cinderella uh l my character L, she appeared in that short story. And obviously, originally, this was just a standalone short story I was doing to get back into writing. But that character really stuck with me. And when I got back from that writing retreat, I started thinking about how I could adapt the original Cinderella fairy tale into um, a dark fantasy novel. So the premise that kind of came to me, I kept stumbling upon this question, which is, um, what if Cinderella was a bloodthirsty vampire who wanted revenge, essentially? So instead of wanting to marry a prince, she wants to kill the prince because he has turned her into a vampire against her will. So I'm not giving away any spoilers, but when the story opens, um, we effectively we see Elle's parents murdered by the prince obviously he's not a prince in my version but uh that's kind of the, the role he's taking on and the story essentially is her journey from becoming a vampire which is something she never wanted learning to control her bloodlust and maybe or maybe not assassinating the prince uh, i'm not going to give it away but uh this one and this one because of the vampire thing I am able to lean into the darker stuff because vampires never die, whether that be because people keep writing stories about them, but they are hard to kill. So the vampire thing was a great first step into the dark fantasy because I can be brutal with her. She can be brutal with other vampires and, you know, it's, it's pretty dark. But yeah, the, the original premise was what if she was a vampire with a first for revenge? And it kind of spiraled from there. And you'll see some... I think we're going to talk about this in a moment, but you'll see some scenes in there that you would recognize from the original fairy tale, I would imagine, but they are twisted and darker and uh, more bloody, definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a, that actually is a great segue to, into the next question. You know, how do you approach a retelling like this where it's, Obviously, like you said, much darker, much bloodier than what someone would expect from Cinderella. How do you um, keep aspects of the story that so that's familiar enough for audiences, but also that you're keeping it fresh so that it feels like its own story for readers? Yeah, so for each fairy tale that I'm retelling, so I'm going to have the Cinderella one, Robin Hood, Red Riding Hood. They're the three that I hope to get out this year. For each of those, I looked at the original structure of all three. And I asked myself, what is the key? Like, if you said to someone, Cinderella, what is the key scene that most people would recognize? Or the, the couple of things that happen that most people would uh, resonate with? So for me, and I asked a couple of other people about this and got the same result. For, for me, the things that I remember about that fairy tale, especially after refreshing myself to, to go back into the project, are her transformation from a serving girl to a princess, um, the ball itself, and then the ending where she and the prince unite over the glass slipper, right? So right. there are no glass slippers in this fairy tale. There are glass things, but uh, again, that's another thing I'll talk okay. about in a minute, how, how you can twist kind of the, uh, the objects that are in the fairy tale. So I knew that the, it had to revolve around this ball that she had to infiltrate in order to assassinate the prince, right? So you've got the original concept of the ball, but I've taken it and twisted it into something new. Um, 
as writers, we hear that all the time. People want the same, but different. Uh, with a fairy tale, you can you can really go to town on that. And then, um, yeah, the other thing that I was going to say was about the objects. So uh, the glass slipper thing just didn't fit for this fairy tale because he's not trying to reunite her with a glass slipper in order to marry her or whatever. So it just wouldn't have fit for this darker retelling. So I've changed some of the objects. Instead of having a glass slipper, my character wears a glass pendant that used to belong to her mother that she loses at the ball, um, which allows for something terrible to happen to her later. And I think what's been interesting about turning fairy tales into dark fantasy is we're so used to the Disney versions of fairy tales where there's a happily ever after in most cases. Um, but going back to the source material, it actually lends itself perfectly to this genre because the, the fairy tale in the original sense are a lot darker than, than I would have thought they were. Uh, so yeah, I think the main things are to take those key scenes from a fairy tale that people really recognize and think about how you can twist them to fit your genre. So I read a lot of fairy tale retellings in preparation for doing this, as you can imagine. And there's a fantastic fairy tale retelling called The Girl in Red, which is a Red Riding Hood retelling by Christina Henry. And she takes some of those obligatory scenes um, or obligatory items rather. So like Red Riding Hood would use an ax in the forest that becomes her main weapon in the uh, book. And then the werewolves, which is obviously an obligatory character, or wolves rather for Red Riding Hood, become genetically engineered wolf-like creatures in a dystopian world. So she's taken <clears throat> the Red Riding Hood fairy tale and twisted it into something dystopian. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd say. Focus on your obligatory scenes and focus on some of the items in the fairy tale that you can twist into something new. And obviously, because I knew this was going to be a series, um, the way I'm structuring it is a series of interconnected standalones with each separate protagonist that's going to lead to an overall story arc. So a bit like Avengers style, I guess. They're all going to have to get together at the end and, and fight a big bad. So, but some of those characters that appear yeah. in the earlier books, I've kind of... Um, combined their roles, if you like. So I'm going to have a Peter Pan retelling where uh, Tinkerbell is a fairy assassin who needs to assassinate Peter Pan, effectively. She appears in this first book, so I've made her not Cinderella's fairy godmother, because that would be too cutesy, but she occupies that role of being a kind of mentor and advisor to Elle as she goes through the book. So it's also thinking about if you're going to have interconnected fairy tales, how can all of the characters mesh and meld together in a way that makes sense? So having the um, overall structure of the story, I guess, like, or having the, the story in place that you're trying to emulate or at least uh, draw inspiration from, did you find that that made it easier in the writing process? Because I know you're a strong outliner. Um, did that make it easier for you because you have the, the structure of a story or did it make it more difficult because in a way you're kind of confined to what, you know, what is familiar for our readers? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. I'd say both. So on the one hand, it's really hard because it needs to be recognizable enough that people understand that that's the story you're retelling. Um, and some of that, you know, some of those things are confining. Certain things need to happen in the story if people are going to recognize what it is. And although I'm a heavy plotter, I kind of, I found it more difficult to reverse engineer a story from, from something that already existed and make it different enough that I'm not just copying the story. Because obviously I think that is um, a major concern when you're going in and doing a retelling. You don't want it to be too similar. Right then people would be like, well, this is the same thing we've already read before. Um, on the other hand, though, because I had the basic fairy tale framework to work with, and even like some of the world building, I've taken 
some of the aspects of those locations that appear in these fairy tales and twisted them and made them darker. And because you have some of the characters and some of the framework already built, that kind of gave me more artistic license to twist and bend things. And as I was going through and plotting and even in the editing phase, I'm thinking, how how much can I twist this stuff and make it really creative? So in a way, it confines creativity because certain things need to happen or at least certain uh, similarities need to be drawn. But at the same time, it allowed me to be more creative because the whole purpose of twisting a, a tale or a fairy tale is to be creative. So it's been a blessing and a curse. I think this one took longer to start. So I think I had, I took about, I had about three false starts before I really sank into the story and what I wanted it to be. And I think that is because I found the structure confining at the beginning. Um, but once I worked out, I think the thing you need to work out really is the points that you want to twist. Because once you know what those twists are and how far you've twisted them away from the original thing, it opens up the creativity. Um, but yeah, it was hard in that initial step to think of ways to make it overly different. And I think it helps because I'm writing fantasy. Um, immediately I can pair the original character with a supernatural creature, combine them, and then that made for a really interesting um, plot. At least for me, when I was plotting, it made it more interesting. So Cinderella being a vampire, that's a nice twist already. Um, so I had it easy in a way, just combining the original character with a supernatural creature. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it sounds like so. You, it sounds like you, you know, you were able to take a few key moments or or uh, points from the originals, and then kind of work your creativity from those points in order to um, kind of fit that creative bug where you didn't feel super pigeonholed. Because I, I think you know you are right. I think people are afraid when they pick up a retelling that oh, I've well, I've read this before, so you don't want to fall into that trap of you know making it something that's not original um you want to give people a new a new experience even though that there are those familiar elements in there to kind of keep them in the in the basis of what they're reading right yeah and i think it was also hard to work out what wasn't going to work for the retelling so there are things that are synonymous with cinderella that i tried to work in and just couldn't use so like her her mouse friends for example like i was trying to do this scene where she's feeding off a mouse but it it just didn't work. And then like the glass slipper thing, I tried for ages to get glass slippers in, but I couldn't think of a feasible way to do that. Um, pumpkin carriages, like, that's just not working for this particular story. So there were also a lot of things that I had to work out. And I think that's why I had so many false starts because I was trying to think, right, which aspects am I actually including? This works really well. And then when it mm -hmm. came to writing it, um, some of those things didn't work. So. I had to then remove them in the edit. So I think now that the world is built, as in I've I've planned ahead and thought a couple of stories ahead, I think it will be easier. But it was really hard to work out what's what's an original twist, what to include, and actually what to leave out was probably the hardest part. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, and you have mentioned and you talked a little bit that this does fit into a bigger universe of other um, fairy tale retellings. Um, can you tell us, I guess, a little bit more about the, the universe as a whole? And I want you to talk a little bit about setting because you said that was the hardest part for you to, to kind of work on. How do you build a world like this and not focus on setting? Or did it kind of um, change the way you had to approach it because you had this bigger universe in mind when you kind of set out to, to create it? Yeah, definitely. So in terms of how it fits into the um, overall universe, I wrote my first series a long while ago. Well, it feels a long time ago to me, but um, I was struggling to go back to that original series because it wasn't connected to anything else I was working on at the time. So I had to think of a way to connect that into all the stuff I'm working on now. So the fairy tale stuff, 
uh, when I go back to the Demon Academy stuff, I wanted them all to be linked so that it had that kind of, I kept getting drawn back to the Avengers as I was working on this. And, you know, what if this group of fairy tale legends have to band together to defeat a big bad Avengers style? Right, so they each have their origin story, then they get together to, I mean, we all know how Marvel works. And then I thought, hang on, if I can re-engineer my first series along the same lines, and then I end up in this kind of, um, so like in the DC shows, Arrow, The Flash, they're all connected, they're all, they're all part of this multiverse, and obviously you're familiar with the multiverse concept, given what you write, but I wanted it so eventually all these characters are going to come together and loopholes are going to start opening in the multiverse. Different characters are going to slip through into different parts of the universe. And then eventually I okay. want all the people from all the universes to band together to fight the biggest of big bads. And that's kind of going to be how it, it all wraps up eventually. Um, okay. The way so, I just... And you're talking about your... Sorry. Uh, yeah. I just, you're you're talking about all of your series. You're not talking about just the Grimvale series. You're talking about your Myth and Magic series and your like all these separate yeah. series banding together. That's what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. Eventually, I want every single separate series to weave together. Um, the mechanics of how I'm going to do that, I haven't really worked out yet. Uh, but I thought the, the way I kind of because then I thought, well, how can I connect them all together? Because some of it is based on Greek mythology. Some of it is based on Arthurian mythology and some of it is based on fairy tales, right? So how am I going to link it all together? Mm -hmm. And the conclusion that I came to was that every single universe is going to have a version of Camelot. Um, and if Camelot were to ever fall in one of the universes, they would start bleeding together. So that's as far as I've got with that at the minute. But I think that is a good enough, uh, good enough link that I can link them together. And I think my decision to do that was because one, if you catch a reader at an entry point, so whenever they pick up one of my series, what I'll be able to do is drop in Easter eggs to some of the other series. Hopefully they will realize that they're all connected and then go on to read more. So it was a business choice, but it's also keeping me engaged because I've got a reason to revisit that first series now um do some rewrites to make it more dark fantasy ish and then complete the series and you did ask uh, something else another part of <laughs> um i asked so i guess let's uh, let's circle back or pull back a little bit into the the grim valley um universe because i know you you've got maps done up is every is every part of that series in the same in the same world or are they in different realms as well yeah so Every part of okay. that series is in the same world, um, apart from the uh, fairy stuff. So apart from the Peter Pan stuff, I wanted okay. to create a version of Neverland that kind of sits over Grimvale. So in my version, it's called the Never, and there is a portal to the Never. Um, I make references to things that you would recognize from the original tale, like the second star on the right and how to get there and all of that kind of stuff. But apart from that, yeah, they're all set in a contained universe for this specific series. Okay, perfect. I, that sounds so exciting. Um, but the second part to my, my previous question was actually, um, you had mentioned that setting was a difficult part for you mm. to work on as, as a writer. That was one of your weak points. How did, um, I mean, now you're creating both a world that um, contains all these fairy tale creatures in, in expanding several books, as well as combining your different worlds into kind of a multiverse setting. Um, how did you approach that? And how were you able to focus on setting in a way that, um, you were able to develop this, this universe. Yeah. Again, I think it was easier with the fairy tales to focus on setting first because I had some inspiration to draw from already. Um, so I was okay. talking about like Neverland there. Well, how can you twist the locations in Neverland to make it into a new, a new place? So I knew going into this, that I would have to focus on setting first. And because this is, secondary world fantasy i knew because i'm a really visual person that i would need something like a map to orient myself 
in the world. So it's been good in a way because it's forced me to focus on setting in a way that I've never had to do before. Oh, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I was just sorry. I just want just wanted to, to add a little bit. Um, what part of setting do you normally find difficult? <laughs> what part don't I find difficult? So the thing that I normally find difficult about setting, and I guess this is coming from you know an urban fantasy standpoint because that's what I was writing before. The things that I would find difficult is that because I was writing in a contemporary world, I I didn't include enough detail because I just assumed that everyone would know what I was seeing because it's a contemporary world, right? And I think I underestimated how much world building still goes into building a contemporary world because, yeah, everyone knows what a cafe is, but nobody knows what your specific cafe looks like or for you like you're writing um your cozy fantasy at the minute and the greatest pub in the multiverse right everyone knows what a pub looks like like if you say to me what's a pub i'll be like yeah sure i know what a pub looks like i don't know what your pub looks like um and i think that's the key I mean, if you're writing in a contemporary world, but especially if you're writing in a secondary world, it's including enough detail that people have a really specific and unique sense of what your world looks like. Um, Okay. I'm trying to think of an example from my first series. Like I had... um, Excuse me. I have a location in my first series where... It's kind of like an underground bunker. So it's this organization known as Coven and they operate um, beneath the earth in kind of like an underground bunker setting. Now, in my first draft and kind of quite late into the editing process, I think my developmental editor actually had to point some stuff out. I made vague references to this underground bunker thinking, yeah, like everyone knows broadly what an underground network of tunnels and bunker system looks like. Um, and I thought I'd included a lot more detail than I actually had. Uh, I hadn't, and it wasn't specific enough. Like there was nothing special about the setting that draws people in. And we spend so, or I spend so long looking at plot and character and working out what's really special about those that I just tend to neglect setting for whatever reason. And I think that's the key. It's making, taking like a, if you're writing contemporary, taking a unique, uh, taking a known setting, sorry, and including enough detail that makes it unique so it becomes yours. And obviously, weirdly, I found it easier to focus on setting in a secondary world because I knew going in that I'd pretty much have to build everything, especially some of the more magical locations. Um, So it's been easier, I think, to pick out unique things in that. Um and so with um so you have the map done up um and everything is that's coming is kind of do you have it kind of foreshadowed in the map so that people kind of know what to expect going forward or um are there pieces that you're going to reveal throughout the series i think in terms of grimvale i to be honest the nether i don't really have a clue what's in my neverland thing yet i've only included certain locations in the first book um but with Grimvale itself, yeah. I intentionally wanted to foreshadow in the map, if you like, certain things that are coming up. So after, um, for the Robin Hood thing, there's a location called Thieves Wood, which is going to play a heavy part in the Robin Hood retelling. And that is mentioned in the first book. You can see it on the map and it's going to be in that book Um, and thinking further out. So if this series plays out the way I think it will, I think there's going to be 14 books for 14 different retellings. Um, So I've included locations like Wintertown that is not going to come into the series until later on, but that will be the setting for my Snow White retelling. And I've tried to name the towns so that there is a hint as to what, the retelling might be. And uh, I've done some engagement with my email list and on social media about trying to get people to guess what retellings I might be doing based on the locations. And that's been really fun. And it's, again, it's forced me to think about the setting first, which 
has has been really useful given that one i'm not used to writing in a secondary world and two um it's nice to use the setting for some reader engagement as well i've never really done that either it's always been about the characters or the plot but it's that's been a way that i can make setting fun this time and i think um that's not a way that i've approached it before but i think i mean just in in chatting about it that it would must be a lot easier while you're writing to be able to reference different places in this world that's already established rather than on the fly just inserting x town name here and then trying to deal with it later on part of the reason that was so important is because i know that if you're writing in a secondary world readers of secondary world fantasy generally want a map so i couldn't do what i did before and just not have a map because that's one of the things that people expect like they want their map in the front of the book yeah they go crazy for the maps they want to look at the map so i needed to do that first if it hadn't been for that i probably would have been in the situation you described which is right random town that i'll probably never mention again and it doesn't actually make sense for the story <laughs> yeah but um and, but you're laying i mean a foundation for for this universe and i think that's gonna that's going to pay off dividends for you later. I'm excited to see how it all pans out. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about your upcoming Kickstarter campaign, though. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what readers can potentially expect from, from that? Yeah, sure. So I wanted to set up a Kickstarter campaign to fund the collector's edition of Glass. Um, and this just comes about because I've seen so many authors producing these amazing collector's editions that readers really love and i've you know i've bought collector's editions before and i think they're fantastic so part of it was to help i'm rubbish at celebrating when new things come out so i knew that by having a collector's edition of glass um that would enable me to celebrate because it's something special that i can create that marks the occasion of of the release the kickstarter won't launch until a bit after the release um, but yeah, that's what readers can expect. So it'll be a special edition version of Glass, which is hardback. So there will be a special edition um, dust jacket that goes over the book, a special edition, um, I've lost the name of it, but like the, there'll be a printed design the on the app. Itself. Yeah, like the case wrap, thank you, on the book itself. Uh, the copies will be hand signed. There'll be a bunch of digital and physical goodies that link into the series. Um, and I'm I'm so excited about it. Again, it's another form of creation and it's made the like the creativity behind it. I wasn't expecting. I was just thinking, right, I'll get a new cover, all the practicalities. But seeing that collector's edition hardback, I think it made the project feel special for me and has made me more mm. invested um which is great and i don't know when i'm going to be launching the campaign yet because it'll it'll depend on so how kickstarter works i don't know if people know but you submit your project for review and then they give you a link that you can share with readers that is a preview page so people can follow your campaign and obviously the more followers you get before you launch in theory the better the project will fund so i'm in that phase at the moment of of building up the awareness of the campaign. Um, but I am excited for this because things like producing hand-signed copies of books for readers with special edition covers, I I just love the idea of doing that, that I can physically sign something tangible for a reader and send it out. Because we're so used to working in digital that you know we, yeah. we miss that sometimes, especially as indie authors. But I'm super excited and I've had a lot of of really positive comments from readers about the cover. Um, and yeah, it, it all just makes it worth it for sure. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the cover. I think it looks great. I think re your readers are in for a treat. Um, I will, you know, I'll make sure to link your, uh, that launch page in the show notes. Um, so people can go check it out and yeah, there, I mean, you touched on a few things there that I, I wouldn't mind just highlighting a little bit, just that, providing something tangible to our readers because I mean often like you said as indie authors we deal mainly with ebooks and a lot of times you see an order on your Amazon page and it's just a not we just see a number right we don't get to often see the readers that pick up the books and enjoy the experience so yeah being able to hand sign and I don't know if you're um, you know 
and put it in the mail physically for someone, I think is, is a special thing that for us to do. Um, and the other piece, the other piece was around the celebration piece of it. I think it must be, a, you know, a futurist trait thing because I'm kind of the same way. Once a book is out, I'm on to the next project. I, I have a hard time taking that moment to celebrate. So a Kickstarter, I think too, provides us with an event that we're able to like, here's a period in time that we're able to celebrate what this is. And, and I mean, I haven't gone through a Kickstarter, so maybe at the end of the Kickstarter, I'll be ready for the next one as well when I launch my, <laughs> but, but I, you know, it does provide a moment in time that doesn't, um, it's not like a book where, um, you know, people can continue to buy the book. You've got a set period of time and then it's done. And I, and I think that will rein that in a little bit. Yeah. And I think it's also made me, not that I haven't been invested in all the other projects I've read, but I think it's made me really invested in the projects because people are going to get this special edition hardback. I also want to make sure the story is as good as it can possibly be. And I always want to do that. But because because of this kind of special edition, I really want to make the story special. So for me, I think when I work Kickstarter into my business going forward and make that part of my production schedule, it's going to make me a lot more invested in the stories and probably make me feel a lot more creative as well, which is something I wasn't expecting um, going into the whole Kickstarter thing. Yeah, I mean, because you're thinking about different pieces of your world that you can incorporate into this project, right? It's not just mm. the story. You've got this entire um, infrastructure of different details that you get to include that you normally wouldn't get to in a in a release. Yeah, exactly. And then just certain things that you can include in the book that the Kickstarter audience will appreciate. Like the, some of the extra merch that I'm giving away, um, obviously the map was one thing. So that again, it was good that I designed the map. Uh, but some of the things like the um, Grimvale theme stickers with slogans from different characters, it's made me focus on dialogue a lot more. And the fact that I want, I need like those snippy hooky lines of dialogue if I'm going to include merch that has my dialogue on it. So yeah, it's just made me be a lot more creative in a lot of different aspects of the project and think about which parts of the story I can pull out and use in other ways. Again, as a fiction author, I've never really thought about um, merchandise that might go along with my books and stuff like that. But doing Kickstarter, obviously mm -hmm. you have to think about that because you're giving away extras with the book. Um, and again, it's, I think it's made the marketing a lot more creative and fun as well. Um, I think before I had a real disconnect between writing and marketing, but because the Kickstarter campaign, when you're building it, is a very creative thing, it kind of links the creativity back in with marketing. And again, something I wasn't expecting. It's, it's had its benefits for sure. Uh, do you also find that having written another series and having tried then tried to do the marketing for it, have you found now going into this series that you are able to focus a lot more on the marketing while you're in the writing process? Yeah, I do, I do think that. And I think that's probably because a lot of the, of the marketing mistakes that I made with my first series. So I wrote, and we, we all do this, like I wrote the books that I wanted to write and I didn't really give much consideration to the reader when I started my first series. I just launched in and I thought, right, I'll figure out all the marketing stuff later. Um, and that was good in a way because I... Good in a way because I was able to write what I wanted to write and figure out how I wrote and what my voice was and all of the stuff that we need to know. Um, but going into this series, I was really conscious of the reader, um, very conscious of the fact that I wanted to write a book that hopefully a lot of people will love. And some of that comes from the marketing. And it just took me a long time to realize that. Um, so I've approached this differently in that I did a lot of research into fairy tale retellings. I read a bunch of fairy tale retellings before I started writing. And not like before, I was an urban fantasy reader. So I thought, right, I'll write urban fantasy but I didn't spend time actually deconstructing other urban fantasy authors work to find out why those books were successful. I just thought, well, I'm writing something similar to them. So cool. Um, whereas with this, I've been a lot more intentional about 
spotting patterns as I've been reading and working out techniques that authors use across most retellings. Like it seems common sense that you would take key events of the fairy tale and twist them, but there are ways you can do that well and ways you can do it not so well. And it's only by reading with a critical eye and also looking at other people's marketing efforts, what they're doing, what kind of things they're pulling out of the book to use for marketing um, that I really didn't do before at all. And obviously, I think that was a mistake because I've had a lot more engagement with this series so far and it's not even out yet than I had with my first series after release. So, yeah, I think it's working. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's interesting approaching writing a book as a reader and then getting um, putting that first book or series out there um, or several first books or series out there and realizing that um, it's it's really a different way to approach things as a writer. There's there's certain things that that you just don't realize until you get that book out there and realize, okay, this was hard to market because there's I don't have that tangible relation that um, that these other books have. And what didn't I do with this book that these books are doing? And then taking a step back for for the next series that you write and being like, okay, well, how can I make this in the book? not 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 even certain specific things but how am i going to tell people about this book how can i what kind of quotes can i pull and what kind of you know tropes and that sort of thing can i use that i can tell readers about <laughs> so they want to read it um and that's definitely definitely a lesson that i've had to learn as well and i and i know that you even the last episode we talked about that that you would start you realized even at that point i don't think you knew what direction you wanted to head with it yet but you knew at that point that I've written this thing and it's hard to kind of sell it because it's not what people are expecting. Yeah, and I didn't, like you said tropes there. Like I didn't even know what a trope was when I first started writing. Me neither. Um, I, Me yeah, neither. <laughs> put some, you know, it'll be fun. Let's just do the thing. And actually a lot of people bulk at the marketing stuff. Um, well, I did as a newer author and a lot of newer authors do, but in a way, it makes it easier. Like if I understand what tropes I'm actually including in the book, or if I understand, um, you know, if you're an outliner, if I understand what types of plots I expect to see in my genre, or if I look at other authors' marketing efforts and I understand what could potentially make these books successful, it makes it a lot easier and takes a lot of the pressure off when you're writing if you're trying to make money from this if you're not that's a, a different story altogether you know write what you want do whatever but if you're trying to make money then it doesn't have to be like this corporate marketing is often seen as like a corporate scammy sleazy thing and it's not that like if you're doing it properly it is just looking at what other readers love and what other thing what things have worked for other authors that have made them successful and including that in your book and don't forget we are well most of us are all readers as writers when we pick up a book we want to love it and all we're doing by looking at things like tropes and what's working well is mar in marketing is doing our best to make sure that we're producing work that readers love and when i reframed it like that it was a lot easier for me to engage in marketing activities. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm the episode that um, is going out the week before yours, um, I chat with Adrian M. Gibson, and he's writing, um, it's a crime noir police procedural series, but oh, nice. with mushroom people. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, and it's, you know, it just it makes me think of it because, I mean, a lot of people here, you know, stick to reader expectations, stick to the tropes, and they think, well, then I have to write what everyone else is writing, but you but that's not what it is. It's, you know, realizing what readers are expecting. Okay, readers are expecting when they pick up his book, a police procedural novel. And then, but he's he's implemented this fantasy element, which are um, these this fungal universe that is incredibly creative. Um, and it's not, um, it's not limiting your capacity to be creative with what you're doing. It's just allowing you to have the language to talk about your book in a way that readers will understand what to expect when they pick up your book. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you mentioned, I think we mentioned Sasha a couple of times, but for those people who 
don't know Sasha Black. She does a lot of um, work around deconstructing other authors' work and working out what essentially works for that book or that genre. And she also talks a lot about tropes. And I have to give a huge shout out to her here because I attended a webinar of hers recently on tropes specifically. And she was talking about how even some of the tropes have become buzzwords that readers gloss over. So like the chosen one, I mean, everyone knows yeah. what that is, but it's not necessarily exciting or sexy in terms of marketing because it's just become something that everyone is familiar with, right? So she's talking about how to be creative with tropes and say what the trope is, but twist it in a way that makes it funny or shocking or, you know, something that even makes the trope a bit unique so that when readers see it, they're like, oh, I understand what that is, but it sounds really cool. So an example for me, like my Cinderella one is a chosen one story. She's the only one that can kill the person that she's trying to kill. But a lot of chosen ones are reluctant to do so. Most chosen ones are reluctant heroes. They don't really want to go on the quest like Frodo or whatever. Um, Elle really does want to do this thing. She wants to be the chosen one because she wants to be the one to kill this guy. So when I talk about how the chosen one works in my book, I'll be like, she would say, damn right, I'm the chosen one, bitches. You know, stuff like that. Just <laughs> twist the trope right. so that you get it. But it becomes something fresh and unique and yeah big shout out to sasha for that because her approach to tropes is is uh, certainly unique and definitely makes readers sit up and take notice absolutely and yeah she has some some great um especially writing books as well for people who are interested they should definitely check check those out uh so shane uh what can readers expect from you next i know you've got this series planned but what's kind of the outlook look like over the next uh next near-term and short-term future for you? Yeah, so near-term, like I said, I want to get the first three um, of these fairy tales out, and then I am going to pivot a little and uh, write my Demon Academy books, which are some dark academia uh, retellings based around angels and demons, which I'm really... I wasn't excited again before because it wasn't linked into anything else and it's a trilogy, but now it's all linked so much the better. Um, mm. I will be rewriting my original series to make it slightly darker and more on brand. And if I get time, <laughs> and it's a big if, because I don't know how long all that is going to take me, but if I get time, um, I would love to write the fourth book in my original series as well and put that out. So yeah, that's what readers can expect over the, the next months or so. Yeah, so much, so much coming out, and I'm excited for all of it. I'm, uh, I'm especially excited for you to finish your first series because been waiting mm -hmm. on that one for for some <laughs> time. So, and interesting to see how you're going to work it in with the the new multiverse too. So, but um, but I'm right with you there. My first series is in need of a revamp and a and a final book. So <laughs> we'll, we'll all get there eventually. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Shane, this is the greatest podcast in the multiverse. I know you answered this question the last time you were on the show. I'd love if you had a different answer for me. But um, can you tell me how, in a parallel universe, a different decision might have shaped another version of your life? Yeah, so I can't remember what I said last time. So I'm just going to riff and talk about I can't this either, time. to be honest. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh how a different decision would have affected my life. So I think there was a time in my corporate job where I had published a few books and because of some of the things we've talked about, like I didn't really focus on the reader, didn't do enough market research or whatever, they weren't doing as well as I had expected. And in my corporate job, I had the opportunity for a different role, which would mean um, greater benefits, more financial security, all of that type of stuff. And I seriously, seriously considered not writing anymore. I seriously considered giving up because it hadn't worked out quite the way I planned and I wasn't on the trajectory I wanted to be. Um, and it was a really, really close decision. Luckily, I decided to carry on writing and I'm glad I did because I wouldn't be here talking to you now if I hadn't. Um, but that would have drastically impacted my life. And, you know, yeah. 
corporate life is for some people. It wasn't for me and it made me pretty miserable. So that could have been something that really impacted my life in a negative way. <laughs> oh, that's such a relatable decision too, as far as, you know, you're writing, especially when you're in and amongst writers who are really successful and your books are just not hitting. Um, and it's a lot of work. I mean, putting a book out is not a simple feat. Even if you're doing it quickly, you're likely spending a lot of hours, um, to, you know, in order to do that. And if it doesn't hit year after year. You're just wondering, yeah, is this worth the, all the hours and time and headaches that I'm putting into this? So, but I am really glad that you uh, persevered and carried on and you are full time now and, uh, and living the dream. And I'm excited to uh, see everything that's coming out for you in the next year or so. Thank you so much. So um, Shane, can you tell our listeners um, where they can find you and where the best place for them to get copies of your books is? Yeah, sure. You can find my books on pretty much all the retailers, I think. And you can buy them direct from me at shanemillerbooks.com. And if you want to reach out and have a chat, I am on uh, TikTok as SW Miller Writes and Instagram as Shane Miller Writes. Wonderful. Thank you once again, Shane. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and I am sure we'll have you again in the future. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back on the show. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed the show, like and subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Greatest Podcast in the Multiverse. As well, you can help support the show by supporting me on Patreon. For as little as $5 a month, you can get early access to the show as well as submit your questions for my upcoming guests. I hope to see you next time. Bye now.